God bless us and the Virgin protect us. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Uh, once again, I want to explicitly acknowledge my debt and gratitude to Our Lady of Fatima. She has to get the credit for anything good or true or beautiful in those Novena conferences. All the faults are mine. In a special way, I also want to acknowledge my debt and gratitude uh, in a particular way to Sister Lucia, whom I relied on so heavily, and also, of course, to St. John the Beloved. Finally, I want to thank the Mother Superior who invited me to preach this novena. Without uh, her encouragement, I would never set out on such a task. And I would like to thank her for firing me on July 13th after five conferences, because without that, I would have never been able to go into so much depth. Ave Maria Prisima. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. First off, okay, today we're going to pick up where we left off in chapter 9 of the Apocalypse and go through chapter 13. It's easy to find other interpretations of these chapters in any particular passage within them, and that's fine. I have more than 30 commentaries dealing with the Apocalypse, and virtually every one of those commentaries differs significantly from others. So it's easy to find other interpretations of these chapters in any particular passage within them, and that's fine. I'm not the Pope. I'm not claiming tonight to give you the interpretation of chapters 9 through 13. What we are going to do is offer a possible interpretation in light of Fatima, uh, starting where we left off in chapter 9 of the Apocalypse, using very, various commentators and the analogy of faith. And that means we're not out to invent something, but rather we'll lead it in the light, and read it in the light of the teaching of the Church, in the light of the rest of Scripture, and in the light of tradition. Now, the last time we went through the first five trumpets, we'll very briefly review. The interpretation we followed for the first trumpet was it signified World War I. The interpretation we followed for the second trumpet was that it signified Russia who spread her errors throughout the world, causing wars and persecutions of the church. The interpretation we followed for the third trumpet was that it signified an apostate priest whose false teachings involved cloaking the errors of Russian deceptive language that were taken from Catholic doctrine, and then these teachings were consequently spread through Catholic academic circles. But that apostate priest was a Jesuit named Pierre Tihar de Chardin, and the heir of Russia is most responsible for introducing into the wider circles of the church is the notion of evolution uh, wrapped up in theistic terms. The interpretation we followed for the fourth trumpet was that it signified the influence of the theological movement known as the Nobel Theology, which is the New Theology. We saw the key principle of the whole New Theology was that in order to be true, theology must change with the times. But these men had forgotten something, and so too have all too many of us. The holy things are here to change us. We're not here to change the holy things. The interpretation we followed for the eagle crying out, whoa, 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 in heaven, was that it was Sister Lucia. The interpretation we followed for the fifth trumpet was that it signified the errors of Russia being spread into the mainstream of the church on the occasion of the council and under the influence of the spirit of Vatican II and other associated spirits that had been released from the abyss. Now we'll get started in just a moment, but first an explanation and a caution. The explanation, a very quick explanation, why things are not always sequential in terms of time in the apocalypse. So this is very, uh, very brief. We could go into detail, but it's brief. God gave St. John a glimpse into glory. He was taken before a throne set in heaven and shown the things which must be done. Now God is outside of time and space. So the vision, this intellectual vision that St. John was given is also outside of time and space. It may at first appear confusing, but one understands that the events overlap each other, building on one another as they go along. Then in order to write something orderly, fashion, and put it into a sequence, many times it's as if he's following one particular aspect of a vision explaining it. And then he turns to another aspect to look at it. But as he does that, it's, and so to speak, he's turning back the clock and following that aspect of the vision on. Okay. The caution. We're going to be talking about the false prophet and the Antichrist during this conference, and if past history is any indication, and human nature doesn't change, there seems to be a great temptation in a lot of men to start guessing who this might be and who that might be. 
So a little bit of warning from St. Irenaeus is definitely in order. Now, St. Irenaeus was a disciple of St. Polycarp. St. Polycarp was himself a disciple of St. John the Beloved, the very apostle who wrote the Apocalypse. And as we're about to see, St. Irenaeus specifically warns against trying to figure out the name of Antichrist and his number. And I think that's imperative by looking at numbers. I think that's imperative to keep the same practice in regards to the name of the false prophet. In short, his name is a secret kept by God until the Antichrist arrives, since he isn't worthy to have his name pre-announced by heaven. St. Irenaeus reports that St. John the Apostle warned that no one should attempt to guess this name from the number. Those who will try this will be easily deceived by him when he arrives under his own name, since they will not be on guard against him. And I quote, Moreover, another danger, by no means trifling, shall overtake those who falsely presume they know the name of Antichrist. For if these men assume one name, when this Antichrist shall come having another, they will be easily led away by him, supposing him not to be the expected one who must be guarded against. Close call. So wait and don't jump to conclusions. We continue with our discussion of the fifth trumpet plague. And the fifth angel sounded the trumpet, and I saw a star fall from heaven upon the earth, and it was given to him the key of the bottomless pit. And he opened the bottomless pit, and the smoke of the pit arose as the smoke of a great furnace, and the sun and the air were darkened with the smoke of the pit. Now, as we've said, the interpretation that we're following is that the star which was given the key to the abyss was the Pope, since I have absolutely no idea what he did to unlock the entrance, I will not even venture an opinion. I do believe there were two stages. The abyss was first unlocked, but the council was the occasion during which it was opened. The smoke pouring out as the smoke of a great furnace symbolizes the smoke of Satan, which flowed into the church during the council, the spirit of Vatican II. And the resulting darkening of the sun and air signifies the errors of Russia pouring out of the church herself, the intensification of the great apostasy and operation of error, this spiritual famine that we've seen growing trumpet after trumpet. And on the last conference, we spoke about the council itself. Today, we're going to start with a closer look at the smoke and the darkening of the sun and the air. Let's start by briefly considering the spiritual family we've seen growing trumpet after trumpet, which now comes to fruition in this fifth trumpet. As we've seen, scriptures make it clear that we're meant to be nourished by God's holy word and solid doctrine. In the book of the prophet Jeremiah, we read, quote, And I will give you pastors according to my own heart, and they shall feed you with knowledge and doctrine. Close quote. In 1 Timothy 4, 6, St. Paul speaks of, quote, being nourished on the words of the faith and of the good doctrine. Close quote. And of course, our Lord himself stated, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. So we're meant to be nourished by God's holy word and solid doctrine, but in a spiritual famine, the people aren't given the words of faith, they're not given solid doctrine, but rather, St. Paul puts it, they're, quote, given doctrines of devils. The prophet Amos explains, quote, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord God, when I will send a famine on the land, not a famine of bread, nor a thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. They shall wander from sea to sea and from north to east. They shall run to and fro to seek the word of the Lord, but they shall not find it. In trumpet after trumpet, we've seen this famine symbolically intensify until now the smoke comes pouring out of the abyss, quote, as the smoke of a great furnace and the sun and air were darkened with the smoke of the pit, close quote. And as we've said, the interpretation we're following in this conference is that this smoke is the smoke of Satan, which flowed into the church during the council, the so-called spirit of Vatican II. The resulting darkening of the sun and the air signifies the errors of Russia pouring out into the church herself, the intensification of this great apostasy. Even before the council had ended, the reality of a spirit of Vatican II was noted by no less than a personage than the Pope himself, who on December 6th, 1965, the day before the council ended, said, quote, once the council's ended, will everything return to the way it was before? Appearances and habits would say yes. The spirit of the council would reply, no, close quote, Pope Paul VI. Now, before he was elected Pope, Karl Ratzinger, who himself was one of the theological experts at the council, also spoke of the spirit being already present at the council itself. Notice that as he speaks of the spirit, he refers to it 
as a pernicious anti-spirit. And also notice the thrust of the spirit, what this spirit does, so to speak. So speaking of the true counsel, Carter Ratzinger states, quote, already during its sessions, he means the sessions of Vatican II, already during its sessions, and then increasingly in the subsequent period, it was opposed by a self-styled spirit of the council, which in reality is a true anti-spirit of the council. According to this pernicious anti-spirit, everything that is new, or presumed such, how many old heresies have surfaced again in recent years that have been presented as something new? According to this pernicious anti-spirit, everything that is new is always and in every case better than what has been or what is. It is the anti-spirit according to which the history of the church would first begin with Vatican II viewed as a kind of point zero. Close quote, Cardinal Joseph Ratzinger. Once the councils ended, will everything return to the way it was before? Appearances and habits would say yes. The spirit of the council would reply no. According to the spirit, Vatican II will be viewed as a kind of point zero in the history of the church. And everything that is new is always, and in every case, better than what has been or what is. Even old heresies, as long as they are presented as something new. So we have a pernicious anti-spirit, according to which Vatican II will be viewed as a kind of point zero in the history of the Church. And according to which everything that is new is always, in every case, better than what has been or what is. Even old heresies as long as they're presented as something new. Now, does a spirit like that sound like it came from heaven? Or does it sound more like something we heard about in the scriptural commentaries on this passage? Remembering that in place of the star falling from heaven, we simply substitute the word Pope. Quote, The obscuration of the sun and sky betokens the darkening of the authority of the church, lowering men's respect for her, and make her appear less divine or no longer divine at all. It signifies the success of the errors or heresies to such a degree as to bring darkness to men's minds. The infection of the error is moral and spiritual and denotes the errors and immorality which the Pope turns loose. True Catholic doctrine is obscured and even lost to many peoples. Close quotes. We'll hear more about that spirit later, but first let's consider how, in the wake of the Council, these novel ideas, that Vatican II will be viewed as a kind of point zero in the history of the Church, that everything new is always in every case better than what has been or what is, even old heresies, as long as they're presented as something new. How these novel ideas, how these errors of Russia were spread throughout the Church, obscuring true doctrine, darkening men's minds, lowering men's respect for the Church, making her appear less divine or no longer divine at all. In that regard, the typically brilliant comments of Father Brian Harrison deserve careful consideration. Quote, It has become a complex of official Episcopal and Vatican responses. With the widespread abandonment of the Catholic Church's sound traditions, the sorry scenario of doctrinal dissent, disciplinary disorder, clerical defections, and other scandals has been in no way due to Vatican Council to itself, but only to abusive and select readings and applications of the Council documents. But this only raises the further question, why has it been so easy for these abusive and selective interpretations of the Council to flourish and diffuse and even impose themselves so widely? After all, this phenomenon has been practically unique in the history of ecumenical councils. In the past, conciliar teachings were frequently signs of contradiction, being subsequently rejected with vehemence by certain groups claiming to be Christian and Catholic. But in each of these controversies, both sides of the dispute were at least in agreement as to whose side the council was on, so the dissident party had no alternative other than to openly reject the conciliar teaching question. After Vatican II, in contrast, practically every heterodox notion that has sullied the Church's continence or infected her immune system has brazenly presented itself as being the real teaching, or at least the real implication, of the council itself. Why has it been easy for liberal dissidents to complain in support of the Council for their views? Simply because the conciliar documents themselves are frequently ambiguous. It would be easy, and much more in accord with prevailing canons of ecclesial political correctness, 
disparages his finger pointing at the council itself as basically a traditionalist or integrist position. But plenty of middle of the road liberal churchmen have admitted the same thing. It is helpful to distinguish between two levels of ambiguity, real and apparent. Generally, when one takes into account what we might call the council's fine print, the footnote references historical and literary context and official explanations given to the council fathers as to why various amendments to the text were made by the Theological Commission, then the only reasonable scholarly way to interpret the passage in question is a traditional orthodox way. In other words, it is not really, or strictly speaking, ambiguous. However, only a minuscule proportion of those men and women of our time who are supposed to be the Council's chief beneficiaries have access to all that fine print. And so the apparent ambiguity of many parts of the main text, deriving either from what it says or from what it conspicuously fails to say, is quite sufficient to have con constituted a public relations victory, all too often a victory for the foes of orthodoxy and tradition. And that is all they needed in order to achieve their de facto takeover of Catholic academies and bureaucracies, bureaucracies throughout so much of the world. Close quotes, Father Brian Harrison. So in short, because of the apparent ambiguity of many parts of the main text, the foes of orthodox tradition were able to present their novel heterodox notions as being the real teaching, or at least the real implication that counts itself. And this enabled them to achieve their de facto takeover of Catholic academy, academies and bureaucracies throughout so much of the world. So let's put this into perspective by considering the following. Given the facts that one, the perennial teaching of the Church, as Benedict XV had put it some 50 years earlier, is that in matters of the faith, the law of our fathers is sacred and must be inviolably adhered to. Quote, let there be no innovation, keep to what has been handed down. Close quote. And during the Council itself, Paul VI reiterated the same principle in different words, when he taught that the dogmas of the faith are unchangeable, that they are adapted to all men of all times and all places, and that, quote, the meaning that Holy Mother of the Church has once declared is to be retained forever, and no pretext of deeper understanding ever justifies any deviation from that meaning, close quote. And yet, too, in many parts of the text of Vatican II, the documents themselves contain apparent ambiguities, to use the term of Father Harrison, and, three, that the average Catholic would quite naturally expect the very theological experts approved by Rome to work at the Council would actually also be reliable and orthodox interpreters of what the Council documents themselves meant, especially in regards to any ambiguities. And yet, four, that a whole host of these very theological experts at the Council were drawn from the ranks of the new theologians, the very school of false prophets that had been condemned by Pius XII men who had adopted a, a Teilhardian evolutionary perspective and who on that basis therefore insisted that since everything changes over time, theology must also change what with the times. In other words, there are no unchangeable dogmas. These are men who had already spread their errors of Russia, all gussied up in pretty Catholic language, through Catholic religious houses, seminaries, and academy. Given all that, is it any surprise at all that disaster ensued? In short, between the ambiguities in the documents and the new theologians being theological experts whose interpretations and evaluations would have naturally been thought to be acceptable by the average Catholic, it's small wonder there was such terrible chaos and confusion after the Council. Now let's be clear, without excusing in any way the agents of Satan who actually and uh, deliberately set out to destroy the faith, the priests, the religious, and the faithful, most especially the bishops, who allowed themselves to be snookered by all this, and as a consequence ended up with a weakened faith, or as it appears in many cases, with no faith at all, they're personally responsible for their plight. If they'd kept saying their prayers, except the rosary, especially the rosary, and stuck to what they knew from their catechism, they might not have been able to explain what was wrong with what they're being told, but they would have known something was wrong and they wouldn't have bought into it either. In her private correspondence, Sister Lucia had a lot to say about this. We'll read a few excerpts from private letters she wrote in the wake of the Council. These are taken from letters written from 1969 to 1971. Quote, It is because the devil has been able to infiltrate evil under the guise of good 
And they act as the blind, leading the blind, as our Lord tells us in his gospel. And its souls go on, allowing themselves to be deceived. It is the diabolical disorientation that is invading the world and deceiving souls. It is necessary to not let yourself be drawn away by the doctrines of disoriented contradictors. The campaign is diabolical. We need to confront it without getting into conflicts. Say to souls that now more than ever we need to pray for ourselves and for those who are against us. Our Lady requested and re recommended that the rosary be prayed every day, having repeated this in all the apparitions, as if forewarning us that in these times of diabolical disorientation we must not let ourselves be deceived by false doctrines that diminish the elevation of our soul to God by means of prayer. The rosary is what sustains a little flame of faith that still has not been extinguished in many consciences. Everybody should burn that into their mind. The rosary is what sustains a little flame of faith that still has not been extinguished in many consciences. Even for those souls who pray without meditating, the very act of taking up the rosary to pray is already remembrance of God, of the supernatural. A simple recollection of the mysteries of each decade is one more ray of light to sustain in souls the still smoldering wick. This is why the devil has made such war against it. And what is worse is that he has succeeded in deluding and deceiving souls who have much responsibility because of the positions they occupy. They are the blind leading the blind, and they would want to base themselves on the council. The disorientation is diabolical. Don't let yourself be deceived. We pray, work, sacrifice ourselves, and trust that in the end, the Immaculate Heart will triumph. Close quotes. Sister Lucia. Sister Lucia pointed out that the devil had succeeded in deluding and deceiving souls who had great responsibility because of their positions. That although they wanted to base themselves on the council, they were in fact the blind leading the blind. And that this was a diabolical disorientation invading the world and deceiving souls. In that light, we'll consider a few statements made after the council by priests, all members of the School of New Theology, who had also served as theological experts at the council. The problem here was not finding enlightening statements. It was limiting the number. And since the statements are pretty self-explanatory, we won't spend time commenting on them. In terms of destruction of the dogmas, Father Rahner states that, quote, the theses of theologians can no longer be a simple, clear-cut yes or no to a doctrine presented in a traditional way, understood by all in the same way, formulated in a fixed fashion. Close quote. Father Chenu, quote, certain ancient dogmatic definitions were no longer adequate for the cultural changes of our times. Father Skilovex, and notice that he uses the word myth when he's speaking of dogmas. Quote, the dynamics of understanding the faith are in essence both demythifying, dissolving the previous definitions of the faith, and remythifying, constructing new definitions of the faith. Father Rahner, quote, there will no longer be one basic, unique, and universal formula of the Christian faith applicable to the whole church. Father Congar, quote, it would be illusory to try to establish historically that the message of Jesus includes the constitution and organization of a church. Father Skilbex, quote, the traditional hypothesis that Mary had decided, decided to live virginally in marriage with Joseph should be dismissed. Here that we see that we actually have to do communions of reparation like tomorrow for the blasphemies of so-called theologians in good standing who served as theological experts at the council. In terms of the destruction of the old system, Father Congar, quote, the council destroyed what I would call the unconditionality of the system. What I understand by system is a complete and very coherent body of ideas transmitted by the teachings of the Roman universities, codified by canon law, protected by the strict and quite efficient vigilance of Pius XII, with reports, admonitions, the submission of writings to Roman censors, etc. In short, a whole system. With the council, this was broken up, and the underground elements surfaced. 
Father Chenu was asked about the terrible chaos in the church after the council. A question, in your opinion, how should one see this whole upheaval? Is it the fault of the priests, the theologians, the faithful? Father Chenu, quote, I see its cause in the council itself, in the logic of its mark, march and its dynamism. For a good measure, we'll throw in one quote from the moderator of the council, the council father who most influenced the overall direction of the council, Cardinal Sunens. Quote, Vatican II did away with the image of an institutional church and opened the doors to an evolution. So we've just heard members of the Novel Theology, the New Theology, priests who have been theological experts at the council, explain in a very matter-of-fact way that both the dogmas of the Catholic Church, those immutable, saving truths that were revealed by God, which have been proclaimed by the Church for the belief of the faithful, as well as the very structure of the Church itself, that both the dogmas and the Church have to be dismissed, dissolved, destroyed, and reformulated. What we just heard then are certain features, certain aspects of that pernicious spirit, the spirit of the Council, described by the very men who give every appearance of having given themselves completely over to it, and who have truly become diabolically disoriented. Now let's consider a few cut, spliced, and edibent comments, and I do that all through every one of these conferences, as you know. But these were made by the Pope, which seem to be referring precisely to that pernicious spirit, the spirit of Vatican II. For the sake of time, we'll just limit ourselves to comments made by Paul VI. Pope Paul VI, quote, The Church is in a disturbed period of self-criticism. What could be better called self-demolition? The opening to the world became a veritable invasion of the Church by worldly thinking. In the very bosom of the Church, there appear works by teachers and writers who will try to express Catholic doctrine in new ways and forms, often desire rather to accommodate the dogmas of the faith to secular modes of thought and expression than be guided by the norms of the teaching authority of the Church. It will be said that the Council authorized such treatment of traditional teaching. Nothing is more false. Some dared impose on Catholic dogma dangerous and sometimes reckless interpretations. There's a great disturbance in this moment in the world of the Church, and thus it is the faith that is in question. What is happening today reminds me of the obscure phrase of Jesus in the Gospel of Luke. When the Son of Man returns, will he still find faith on the earth? Books are being published in which the faith is denied in important points, yet the bishops remain silent, as if they do not find anything strange in these books. This, in my opinion, is bizarre. I sometimes read the Gospel of the End Times and discern that in this moment there are emerging some signs of this end. Something preternatural, by that he means his spirit, something preternatural has come into the world precisely to disturb it. From some fissure, the smoke of Satan has also entered into the temple of God. In the church, too, the state of uncertainty reigns. It was believed that after the council, a sunny day in the church's history would dawn, but instead there came a day of clouds, storms, and darkness. Close quote. From some fissure, the smoke of Satan has entered into the temple of God. After the council came clouds, storms, and darkness. And he opened the bottomless pit. The smoke of the pit arose as the smoke of a great furnace. And the sun and the air were darkened with the smoke of the pit. The faith is in question. Books are being published in which the faith is denied at important points, yet the bishops remain silent, as if they do not find anything strange in these books. Catholic doctrines are being expressed in new ways. The dogmas of the faith are being accommodated to secular modes of thought. Some dared impose on Catholic dogma, dogma dangerous and sometimes reckless interpretations. Here we're seeing the Pope himself warning that globally speaking, dogma of faith is not being preserved. Globally speaking, the dogma of faith is not being preserved. And as we know, the introduction of the third secret states that in Portugal, the dogma of the faith will always be preserved, etc. 
And there's an immediate consequence that flows from all these changes. Apostasy. Apostasy, the complete abandonment of the Catholic faith. Why would apostasy be an immediate consequence from all these changes? Because, as a noted theologian recently noted, the Church cannot change the faith and at the same time ask believers to remain faithful to it. The Church cannot change the faith and at the same time ask believers to remain faithful to it. So when someone sees even one dogma of the faith be apparently changed, reworded, reinterpreted, the temptation can be very strong to say to himself, right, okay, so if the Church was lying to me on this, why should I believe anything else she teaches? These people are a bunch of liars and all they want is my money. He chucks the whole thing overboard, walks out of the church, and never comes back again. And the number of people who have done just that in so many words is legion. Small wonder that her private correspondent, Sister Lucia, was so adamant that, quote, in these times of diabolical disorientation, we must not let ourselves be deceived by false doctrines. Close quote. And in that light, consider this remarkable statement to what Paul VI made on October 13, 1977. Now that's the 60th anniversary of the miracle of Son. And I quote the Pope. The darkness of Satan has entered and spread throughout the Catholic Church, even to its summit. Apostasy, the loss of the faith, is spreading throughout the world and into the highest levels within the Church. Close quote, Pope Paul VI. The darkness of Satan has entered and spread throughout the Catholic Church, even to its summit. Apostasy, the loss of the faith, is spreading throughout the world and into the highest levels within the church. So we've seen the spiritual famine grow trumpet after trumpet. And over that whole course of time, the popes have been issuing warnings about the apostasy. In his first encyclical, for example, written in 1903, Pope Pius, St. Pius X warned that, quote, society is at the present time, more than, any, more than in any past age, suffering from a terrible and deeply rooted malady which developing every day and eating in its most inner being is dragging it to destruction. This disease is apostasy from God. There is good reason to fear lest this great perversity may be, as it were, a foretaste, and perhaps the beginning of those evils which are reserved for the last days. And now in the wake of the Council, Paul VI is warning that the apostasy, the loss of the faith, is spreading throughout the world and into the highest levels within the church. And the context of that papal warning is very significant. It's being given on the 60th anniversary of the miracle of the sun. So the apostasy has spread throughout the world to the very heights of the church. Both scripture and tradition speak explicitly of such an apostasy. In 2 Thessalonians 2.3, St. Paul warns us there will come a time when the Gentile peoples who have the true faith will reject it. They will reject that free and loving submission of their entire being to Christ. They will refuse to recognize the sovereign rights that God has over them, and they will turn back towards paganism. St. Augustine said that not all will abandon the faith, but few will retain it. That massing turning away from one true faith, their rebellion by Catholics against the true faith, is known as the great apostasy. During the great apostasy, excepting for a tiny remnant that holds on to the true faith, that holds on to Christ our Lord, the whole world will sink into a condition of darkness and sin that is like nothing that has ever gone before. And the overriding note will be an explicit rejection of Christ. So unlike our ancestors, the pagans, who worshipped false gods but didn't know who Christ was, the neo-pagans worship false gods, but they know who he is. They actually know so accepting for a tiny remnant that holds on to the true faith, that holds on to Christ our Lord, the whole world, all of mankind, Jew and Gentile alike, will be immersed in an atmosphere like nothing that has ever gone before, 
a satanic atmosphere impregnated with an explicit rejection of Christ. An immediate result of this rejection of Christ in his church will be the atmosphere of sin and depravity. As we've seen before in Luke 17, verses 26 to 30, our Lord specifically states that the conditions at the end of the world would mirror both the days of Noah and the days of Sodom and Gomorrah. We've already seen that the ancient Jewish commentaries state that, quote, the generation of the flood was not wiped out until they wrote marriage documents for the union of a man to a man or to an animal. Close quote. The generation of the flood was not wiped out until they wrote marriage documents for the union of a man to a man or a man to an animal. We've already seen that these are like the days of Noah and the days of Sodom and Gomorrah. This also brings one last phrase in this passage of the Apocalypse into sharper focus. Quote, and he opened the bottomless pit, and the smoke of the pit arose as the smoke of a great furnace. Because that obviously harkens back to Genesis 19, 28, where we read that, quote, the smoke of the land went up like the smoke of a furnace. That passage is describing the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. We continue with the fifth trumpet plague, the first woe. So far the abyss has been unlocked and opened and the smoke has come pouring out, darkening the sun and air. Now we're going to see a demonic horde of locusts come, come out of that smoke. And from the smoke of the pit there came out locusts upon the earth. And power is given to them as the scorpions of the earth have power. It has commanded them that they should not hurt the grass of the earth, nor any green thing, nor any tree but only the men who have not the sign of God on their foreheads. And it was given to them, unto them that they should not kill them, but they should torment them five months. And their torment was as the torment of a scorpion when he striketh a man. And in those days men shall seek death and shall not find it. And they shall desire to die, and death shall fly from them. And the shapes of the locusts were like unto horses prepared unto battle. And on their heads were, as it were, crowns like gold. And their faces were as the faces of men. And they had hair as the hair of women, and their teeth were as lions. And they had breastplates as breastplates of iron. And the noise of their wings was as the noise of chariots and many horses running to battle. And they had tails like to scorpions, and there were stings in their tails, and their power was to hurt men five months. And they had over them a king, an angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in Hebrew is Abaddon, and Greek Apollyon, and Latin Exterminans. From the commentaries, quote, The vision is one of the most important of the whole apocalypse. It foretells conditions and events destined to usher in the reign of Antichrist. Throughout the Old Testament, the locust is a symbol of destruction. In the spiritual havoc which the first woe spreads over the earth, these locusts will consume the means of spiritual life, which results in a famine of the soul, ultimately pointing to punishments coming on sinners because of the spiritual famine the emptiness of their hearts, and the barrenness of their souls. This destruction emanating from the pit is deceptive influences, especially false teaching affecting non-believers, but not those truly loyal to God. These locusts symbolize demons, heretics, and apostates who swarm over the earth, spreading spiritual destruction far and wide, attacking men. In this respect, they have the power and nature of scorpions. Their sting burns and poisons the soul with false doctrine. They are bold enough to intimidate those who do not have the sign of God on their foreheads and are therefore too indifferent to hold fast to their faith. But they do not injure those who remain faithful to the graces received in baptism and confirmation. The crown of imitation gold denotes they have arrogated themselves authority to rule, tyrannize, and subject people against their will. The locusts have hair like that worn to women, which symbolizes voluptuousness, effeminacy, and vainglory. They are cruel, yet have not the other qualifications of lines, but only the teeth to lacerate defenseless victims. They meditate and plan evil. They give themselves up to sensuality and vainglory, and listen only to sentimental pleas. They destroy the institutions and means of sanctification and terrorize people into subjection. They lacerate all those who do not submit to their tyranny. The iron breastplates show them to be obstinate and unwilling to listen to reason. And although clearly convinced of their errors, they would rather die and renounce them. Their wings are a portent of the speed and rapidity with which the spiritual scourge shall spread over the earth. 
Like war horses, they trample all opposition underfoot. In Isaiah 9, verses 15 to 17, the tale is a symbol of lying, hypocrisy, and false doctrines. The poisonous sting in the tails of these monsters aptly represents sophistry, cunning, deceit, and the false conclusions which propagators of heresy draw from Scripture and from the teachings of the Church by which they mislead their victims. These locusts are not permitted to kill the sinners nor drive them into hell, but only to torture them for a short time, symbolically five months. The test is not to be a bodily one, but purely a spiritual torment. All they may do is inflict anguish of spirit, torture the conscience by depriving them of the means of spiritual life, but they cannot destroy the church. In those days, men seek death and find it not. The good would welcome death as an escape from the evils and miseries that surround them. Many who have been led astray by false doctrines would likewise welcome death as a relief from their doubts and remorse of conscience. Unbelief and doubt in a future existence make men too weak to subdue their passions, and indulge passions bring disgust with life. Their intellects have become confused by the errors of which they are victims, and the false moral standards set up by the leaders of the apostasy deliver them into the torturing tyranny of every vice. Slavery to sin, dissatisfaction, anguish of heart, and fear of eternal damnation. Indulgence in sinful pleasures brings ultimately nothing but pain. The pangs of conscience torturing these apostates are so keen at times that they bring on the desire of death. For a short time, symbolically five months, those who lose their faith and surrender to sophistry and heresy are horrified at their condition, and the fear of damnation takes hold of them. They feel the injustice and wretchedness of their state, but after some time they become callous to the sting of conscience, and then their consciences become inert. They go satisfied with their spiritual status, and they will even defend their deliberations and actions. These figurative locusts have a king, an evil representative of the devil. In the apocalypse, kings are those earthly rulers who follow the beast and do his bidding. This king's name is Abaddon, destruction, Apollyon, the destroyer, exterminans, exterminator. These locusts obey him and do his work. He aims at the destruction of the church, of the faith of his poor victims, and of their souls forever in hell. His minions are the leaders of heresy, schism, and persecution. In several places in the Greek Old Testament that would have been used by St. John, the Hebrew word Abaddon, destruction, was translated into the same Greek word used in 2 Thessalonians 2.3, where the Antichrist is described as a son of destruction. And by St. John himself in chapter 17, verse 12 of his gospel, where he used the same expression to describe Judas Iscariot. Close quotes. Thus, the commentaries. Okay, it's certainly true that the locust is a powerful symbol of destruction. Just speaking on the level of grass and vegetation, a locust swarm is an extremely powerful image of destruction for anyone here who's ever experienced this. And there's uh, three of us here tonight that have lived through that in the middle 80s in the big open in Montana. They came in on a southeast wind. There are so many of them, they darken the sky like a cloud covering the sun. They fell out of the sky like hailstones. And as soon as they landed, they started chewing on everything. They even started chewing, trying to chew on people, which is something no, no one around there had ever seen before. Walking around over the country around there, there were so many of them on the surface of the ground. As you walked along your path, they'd all be hopping up. It was almost like a cloud of hoppers, three and a half, four feet deep, all around you in this big circle as you walked along everywhere you went. In some places, there were so many of them crawling over the highway, it looked like moving carpet. It'd be slippery. In order to keep from overheating, you'd have to stop and scrape your radiator off. And the grain fields looked like they, they were just hammered. They looked like they got hailed out. It was unbelievable. The range looked like a, a really severe drought. And they'd chew and literally eat weathered wood on, on fence posts. They'd chew on wooden house siding. They ate window screens. They just flat every, ate everything they could. So locust swarm is a powerful image of destruction. It's powerful. But the locusts in the apocalypse symbolize demons, heretics, and apostates who swarm over the earth, spreading spiritual destruction far and wide, especially because of false teaching. They're an army of cruel, effeminate, obstinate men given over to sensuality and vainglory who rule, tyrannize, and subject people against their will and who intimidate those who are too indifferent to hold fast to their faith. They're not able to injure those who remain faithful to graces received in baptism and confirmation. For a short time, 
symbolized by five months. Those who lose their faith and surrender to the lies and heresy are horrified at their condition as the fear of damnation takes hold of them. But after time, they numb their consciences, go to accept their situation, and at, the, at that point will often defend their actions. These locusts have a king, an evil representative, the devil, whose name is the destroyer. They obey him and do his work. He aims at the destruction of the church, of the faith of his poor victims, and of their souls forever in hell. His minions are the leaders of heresy, schism, and persecution. Now, given that our interpretation of that smoke is that it's the smoke of Satan, the spirit of Vatican II, and associated spirits flowing out of the abyss and into the church during the council, and the resulting darkening signifies the errors of Russia spreading out of the church herself, intensifying the great apostasy, the spiritual famine that's been growing trumpet after trumpet. Given all that, and given that the locusts come out of that very smoke pouring out of the pit, in regards to these locusts, we will follow a twofold interpretation in this conference. We'll take this imagery as having, at one and the same time, two principal significations. On the one hand, these are evil spirits released from the abyss. And on the other hand, these are the human agents of those very spirits. The men who actually opened themselves up to these spirits, who actually gave themselves over to them. The men who actually embraced the spirit of Vatican II and its associated spirits. And then, just as a plague of locusts destroys all the vegetation in its path, so also these men swarm over the earth, destroying as much as possible everything spiritual in its path. And the fact that these locusts wear crowns is indicative that they're rulers, they're in positions of authority. So for the most part, these demonic locusts are the bishops, priests, and religious who actually embraced the spirit of Vatican II and its associated spirits. And to the very degree they actually opened themselves up to those spirits, to the very degree they actually gave themselves over to those spirits, to the very degree they actually embraced those spirits, to that very degree they destroyed everything spiritual in their path. Let's just quickly consider just a few of the destructive acts. In regards to scripture, denying the divine authorship of scripture, denying its inerrancy, promoting evolution, mocking Catholics who actually believe in a literal Adam and Eve and seven-day creation as fundamentalists, denigrating miracles. Our Lord didn't really multiply loaves and fish. He got everybody to share what they brought, etc., etc. In regards to dogma, insisting that dogmas can change, denying that hell exists, or if, or if it does, if anyone goes there, denying that purgatory exists, or if it does, anyone goes there. Denying that limbo exists, etc., etc., etc. In regards to Catholic morality, denying the reality of mortal sin, denying that contraception and sterilization are mortally sinful, producing annulments for virtually any cause, and in the process, denying that the average person can actually mean what he says when he says, I do. Denying that homosexuality is a perversion, suggesting that those living in sin may be given Holy Communion. We could go on and on. They've wreaked havoc in liturgy, with vestments, with statues, with altars, with architecture, with music, with devotions, with Catholic publishing, with catechism, with Catholic education at every level, from kindergarten right up through college and graduate school, with seminaries, with monasteries, with convents, with religious orders, with the priesthood. They haven't left anything untouched. And that includes the altar boys. Don't forget the sodomitical implications of the smoke out of which these locusts appear. As we've seen, the same phrase was used to describe the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. And in the commentaries, we already heard the locusts described as if they were a bunch of perverts. The long hair is symbolic of voluptuousness, effeminacy, and vainglory. They're cruel. They meditate and plan evil. They love to subject people against their will. Their motives are pleasure and vainglory. They listen only to sentimental pleas. They destroy the institutions and means of sanctification and terrorize people into subjection. They lacerate and torment everyone who doesn't submit to their tyranny. They're obstinate, unwilling to listen to reason. And even when they're clearly convinced they're theirs, they'd rather die than renounce them. And as they wreck and destroy and chew up, leaving destruction and passing their paths. 
as the posse flows to the church, swelling and ripening like the bloated carcass of a dead animal. When the devastation of these locusts has reached a lamp maximum, when it suddenly becomes virtually impossible to find a di- diocese that isn't riddled with the errors of Russia, when not only in society but also in the church, it becomes as it was in the days of Noah and the days of Sodom and Gomorrah. When that plaintive, prophetic cry of Paul VI reaches its perfect fulfillment. In other words, when the darkness of Satan has truly entered and spread throughout the Catholic Church, even to its summit. When the posse has spread throughout the world and to the highest levels within the Church. When all these things shall come to pass, then their king will arrive. Quote, And they had over them a king, the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in Hebrew is Abaddon, and in Greek Apollyon, and Latin Exterminans. So this king is the angel of this, and he's variously named Abaddon, Apollyon, and Exterminans, which means destruction, destroyer, or exterminator. In regards to this king, the angel of this, will follow the same twofold principle of interpretation as we did with the locusts. We'll take this imagery as having, at one and the same time, two principal significations. On the one hand, this refers to an evil spirit released from the abyss, a spirit variously named the bad, a polyon or exterminance, destruction, destroyer, or exterminator. So that's on the one hand. And on the other hand, we'll take this imagery as referring to a human agent of that very spirit, to a man who actually opens himself up that very spirit, to a man who actually gives himself over to that very spirit, to a man who actually embraces the spirit, various the name of bad and Apollyon or exterminants, destruction, destroyer, or exterminator. Now, I've already seen men who have given every indication of having been human agents of just such a spirit. Remember that Marx loved the words of, of Mephistopheles and Faust. Everything in existence is worth being destroyed. In fact, destroy was his nickname. We also saw that immediately after the Bolshevik Revolution, Lenin, Lenin summarized the program by stating that, quote, we shall destroy and smash everything. Ha, 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 ha. Everything we smash is smithereens and fly off in all directions, and nothing will remain standing. Yes, we are going to destroy everything. And we even briefly considered some of the destruction inflicted by the men being guided by the spirit of destruction most notably the deliberate murder of some 100 million people by their own governments. From the looks of it then, it seems more than reasonable to presume that this spirit has been one of the guiding forces propelling the errors of Russia from the beginning. So we're talking about an evil spirit from the abyss, variously named a bad and appalling exterminator, destruction, destroyer, exterminator. exterminator. We're also talking about a human agent of that spirit to a man who actually opens himself up to this very spirit, to a man who actually gives himself over to this very spirit, to a man who actually embraces this spirit, variously named Abaddon, Apollyon, or Exterminators, Destruction, Destroyer, Exterminator. The commentaries tell us that in the version of Old Testament that would have been used by St. John the Apostle, the Hebrew word Abaddon, Destruction, had been translated in the same Greek word used in the New Testament to describe both Judas Iscariot and the Antichrist. In other words, one of the names of this man is associated in Scripture with both Judas Iscariot and the Antichrist. The Apocalypse tells us that he's a king. In that regard, the commentaries give a very, I guess, a very important item of information. Quote, in the Apocalypse, kings are those earthly rulers who follow the beast and do his bidding. Close quote. So this man is an earthly ruler who will follow the beast and do his bidding. And although, as we'll see, there are two beasts, for reasons that will become apparent later in this conference, we will take the beast he's following as being the Antichrist. The Apocalypse tells us that he's the angel of the abyss. This is a very significant and frightening choice of words. Quoting from the Common Catholic Commentary, angel means a bishop or priest throughout the apocalypse, unless the context clearly shows him to be a celestial or an evil spirit. 
So this man who actually opens himself up to the spirit, various name, the bad, and Apollyon, or exterminans, destruction, destroyer, or exterminator. This man who actually gives himself over to the spirit, this man who actually embraces his spirit, as a bishop or a priest, will follow the Antichrist and do his bidding. And as we've already heard, the commentary state that he aims at the destruction of the church, at the destruction of the faith of his poor victims, and the destruction of their souls forever in hell. And there's minions that are leaders of heresy, schism, and persecution. And Apocalypse also tells us that he's the king of the locusts. And that's a very significant, frightening choice of words. Remember that in regards to these locusts, we follow a twofold interpretation. On the one hand, of evil spirits released from the abyss. On the other hand, of the human agents of those very spirits. The men who actually opened themselves to those spirits, who gave themselves over to those spirits, who actually embraced the spirit of Vatican II and his associated spirits. And then, just as locusts swarm over, the, locusts swarm destroys all the vegetation in its path, so also these men swarmed over the earth, destroying as much as possible everything spiritual in its path. We conclude these demonic locusts symbolize the bishops, priests, and religious who actually embrace the spirit of Vatican II and its associated spirits. So locusts are the bishops, priests, and religious who actually embrace the spirit of Vatican II and its associated spirits. And our king is a man who actually opens himself to the spirit, variously named the bad, Apollyon, or exterminans, destruction, destroyer, or exterminator. A man who actually gives himself over to the spirit, a man who actually embraces the spirit, a man who aims at the destruction of the church, a man who aims at the destruction of the faith of his poor victims, a man who aims at the destruction of their souls forever in hell, a man whose minions are the leaders of heresy, schism, and persecution, a man whose name is associated in scripture with both Judas Iscariot and the Antichrist, a man who will follow the Antichrist and do his bidding, a man who's either a bishop or a priest. That's who we're talking about here. There can only be one man who rules the bishops, priests, and religious in the Catholic Church. That's who we're talking about here. Be careful. Remember the warning of St. Irenaeus. St. Francis of Assisi made a very interesting prophecy about someone he called, quote, the destroyer, close quote. It seems to deal with the time near the end of the first wall, going on to the sixth trumpet plague, the second wall. Now what I'll read to you is taken from a book entitled The Works of the Seraphic Father, St. Francis of Assisi. It's a translation from an 1848 edition of the works of St. Francis that was published in Cologne. The particular book we'll read from has an 1882 imprimatur given by William Bernard, the Bishop of Birmingham, England, and it's readily available at archive.org. The title of this section of the book is The Saint Prophesies Great Schisms and Tribulations in the Church. Quote, A short time before the Holy Father's death, they're speaking of St. Francis here. A short time before the Holy Father's death, he called together his children and warned them of the coming troubles, saying, Act bravely, my brethren. Take courage and trust in the Lord. The time is fast approaching which there will be great trials and afflictions, perplexities and dissensions, both spiritual and temporal, will abound. The charity of many will grow cold, and the malice of the wicked will increase. The devils will have unusual power. The immaculate purity of our order, Franciscan order, the immaculate purity of our order and of others will be so much obscured that there will be very few Christians who will obey the true sovereign pontiff and the Roman Church with loyal hearts and perfect charity. At the time of this tribulation, a man not canonically elected will be raised to the pontificate, who by his cunning will endeavor to draw many into error and death. Then scandals will be multiplied, our order will be divided, and many others will be entirely destroyed, because they will consent to error instead of opposing it. 
There'll be such diversity of opinions and schisms among the people, the religious and the clergy, that except those days were shortened, according to the words of the gospel, even the elect will be led into error, were they not specially guided amid such great confusion by the immense mercy of God. Then our rule and manner of life will be violently opposed by some, and terrible trials will come upon us. Those who are found faithful will receive the crown of life, but woe to those who, trusting solely in their order, shall fall into pity, for they will not be able to support the temptations permitted for the proving of the elect. Those who preserve their fervor and adhere to virtue with love and zeal for the truth will suffer injuries and persecutions as rebels and systematics. For the persecutors, urged on by the evil spirits, will say they're rendering a great service to God by destroying such pestilent men from the face of the earth. But the Lord will be the refuge of the afflicted and will save all who trust in him. In order to be like their head, Jesus Christ, these elect will act with confidence. By their death will purchase for themselves eternal life. Choosing to obey God rather than man, they will fear nothing, and they will prefer to perish rather than consent to falsehood and perfidy. Some preachers will keep silent about the truth, and others will trample it underfoot and deny it. Sanctity of life will be held in derision, even by those who outwardly profess it. For in those days, Jesus Christ will send them not a true pastor, but a destroyer. There will be great trials and afflictions. The charity of many will grow cold, and the malice of the wicked will increase. The devils will have unusual power. There will be very few Christians who will obey the true sovereign pontiff of the Roman Church with loyal hearts and perfect charity. At the time of this tribulation, a man, not canonically elected, will be raised to the pontificate, who by his cunning will endeavor to draw many into error and death. Then scandals will be multiplied, and many religious orders will be entirely destroyed, because they will consent to error instead of opposing it. There will be such diversity of opinions among the people, the religious, and the clergy, that except those days were shortened, even the elect would be led into error, were they not specially guided by the immense mercy of God. Those who adhere to virtue with love and zeal for the truth will suffer injuries and persecutions as rebels and schismatics. Some preachers will keep silence about the truth, and others will trample it under foot and deny it. Sanctity of life will be held in derision even by those who outwardly profess it. From those days, Jesus Christ will send them not a true pastor, but a destroyer. And all that sheds a brighter light on that remarkable statement that Paul VI made on the 60th anniversary of the miracle of his son. The darkness of Satan has entered and spread throughout the Catholic Church, even to its summit. Apostasy, lost the faith, is spreading throughout the world and into the highest levels within the Church. One woe is past, and behold, there come yet two woes more hereafter. The sixth trumpet. And the sixth angel sounded the trumpet. And I heard a voice from the four horns of the great altar, which is before the eyes of God, saying to the sixth angel who had the trumpet, Loose the four angels who are bound in the great river Euphrates. And the four angels were loosed who were prepared for an hour and a day and a month and a year for to kill the third part of man. From the commentaries. Quote, God's action in history proceeded from his altar, where he has received the prayers of the saints. The golden altar is the heavenly counterpart to the altar of incense that stood right before the veil in the temple. In the temple, the golden altar of incense had four horns which protruded from the four corners of the altar. Horns are symbols of power and authority. And the incense burnt on it symbolized the prayers and intercession of the people going up to God as a sweet fragrance. In the apocalypse, the heavenly altar of incense is where the prayers of the saints ascend before God. Since it is explicitly said that the golden altar is before God, the voice from the altar cannot be the voice of God. The voice does not come from the horns, but from the altar itself. The four horns, one at each corner of the altar, refer, refer to an important aspect of the Old Testament liturgy. According to the book of Leviticus, sins pollute the land where they take place, and these sins also defile the sanctuary. This stain or defiling the sanctuary was cleansed by the purification offering. The purification offering dealt with the pollution caused by sin. If sin polluted the land, it defiled particularly the sanctuary. The seriousness of pollution depended on the seriousness of the sin, which in turn related to the status of the sinner. 
If a private citizen sinned, his action polluted the sanctuary only to a limited extent. Therefore, the blood of the purification offering was only smeared on the horns of the altar of burnt sacrifice. If, however, the whole nation sinned, or the holiest member of that nation, the high priest, sinned, this was more serious. The blood had to be taken inside the tabernacle and sprinkled on the veil and on the horns of the altar of incense. This was the only way the altar could be purified. The Jewish sages view the four horns as symbolizing the four corners of the earth. For in Hebraic thought, the earth is nothing more than a large altar dedicated to God. The four captive angels are demons who will arouse increased enmities against the church. For the number of universality indicates how widespread will be their influence. Their task is to lead a demonic army to punish the people of the world. It is possible, however, that the four angels represent four nations. They appear to be in charge of a limitless horde of demonic horsemen who ride across the pagan world spreading terror and death. They are loosed for the purpose of killing a third of the world's population. John sees this assault as a divine judgment upon a corrupt civilization. Many of the terrible invasions of Palestine by the Syrians, Babylonians, and Persians came across the Euphrates, thus it became a symbol of foreign invasion. With the prophets of old, the region of the Euphrates was ever the country whence came the enemies of God's people. The term may be taken literally to represent peoples from that region who are hostile to the church. Even the time for the manifestation of these evil spirits and their minions has been accurately fixed in the designs of providence. The very day and hour has been determined. Great numbers will be done to death in the religious wars and revolutions stirred up by these angels from the Euphrates. The release of these four evil spirits may precede a resurgence of Mohammedanism, may lead its religionists to unite with communists in a holy war against all nations who will not join them or submit to their domination. That's has an imprimatur in 1956. The four evil spirits have waited a long time for the hour in which they might begin their depredations. They cannot begin their murderous work until the predetermined hour. Their bloody task is to kill a third of the human race. The second wall culminates in the reign of Antichrist. This period is described by the ancient fathers as the most dreadful of all. Close quotes. Thus the commentaries. Let's briefly consider what we've seen regarding the altar. The golden altar is the heavenly counterpart to the altar of incense that stood in the temple. It had four horns, symbols of power and authority, which protruded from the four corners of the altar. And the incense burnt on it symbolized the prayers and intercession of the people going up to God as a sweet fragrance. Those four horns played an important role in the liturgy of the Old Testament. If the land had been defiled by sin, this in turn would defile the sanctuary. So a special ritual called the purification offering was necessary in order to cleanse and purify the sanctuary again. The gravity of sin and the status of the sinner together determined the magnitude of the defilement. If an ordinary member of the faithful sinned, his sin polluted the sanctuary only to a limited extent which case the blood of the animal sacrifice for his sin was not smeared on the horns of the golden altar of incense, but only on the horns of the brass altar of sacrifice. On the other hand, if the whole nation sinned, or the holiest member of that nation, the high priest sinned, this is far more serious. In order to cleanse and purify the sanctuary in these cases, the sacrificial blood had to be taken inside the holy place and sprinkled on the veil hanging before the holy of holies, and it had to be smeared on the four horns of the golden altar of incense, and this was the only way the altar could be purified. The voice does not come from the horns, but from the altar itself. And since it's explicitly stated the golden altar is before God, the voice from the altar cannot be the voice of God. And finally, according to the ancient Jews, the earth itself is a huge altar dedicated to God, and the four horns symbolize the four corners of the earth. So let's start by considering this voice from the altar. Given that a voice is heard from that altar, actually asking for the release of the demons that have been bound, we're going to lead a massacre of a third of the population of the earth. We have to ask, what is that all about? Why would a voice be crying out from the altar for the massacre of a third of the people on earth? Well, that's actually easy to see once we recognize the earth itself is a huge altar. And so for this conference, we will take the voice from the altar as being a voice crying out from the earth. We'll read a few scriptures here to make this clear. Genesis 4, 9 and 10. The Lord said to Cain, where is Abel your brother? He said, I do not know. Am I my brother's keeper? The Lord said, what have you done? The voice of your brother's blood is crying out to me from the ground. The voice of the murdered. 
all those mowed down around the globe, wars, crimes, hatred, especially abortion. The estimate since 1980s, there have been some 1.44 billion babies aborted worldwide. Almost one and a half billion babies sacrificed since 1980. So it's the voice of an ocean of blood crying out from the ground. Genesis chapter 18, verses 20, 21, and 19, 13. Then the Lord said, Because the outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is great, and their sin is very grave, I will go down to see whether they have done all together according to the outcry which has come to me. We are going about to destroy this place because the outcry against his people has become great before the Lord. The Lord has sent us to destroy it. The voice crying out against sodomy. Fifty years ago, Acceptance Week, which had decriminalized in 1938. Sodomy was illegal throughout the entire world. Now it's a global phenomenon. The voice crying out against sodomy. Exodus 2, 23 and 24. In the course of those many days, the king of Egypt died. And the people of Israel groaned under their bondage cried out for help. Their cry and their bondage came up to God. God heard their groaning. A voice crying out against the oppression of the poor. This too is a global phenomenon. To take only one example, on December 10th, 1974, the National Security Council, that's the highest decision-making body on foreign policy in the United States, promulgated the National Security Study Memorandum, NSSM, 200. It's also called the Kissinger Report. You can read it online. It specifically calls for population control measures, abortion, sterilization, and contraception to be implemented in lesser developed countries. And it also specifically calls for the U.S. to cover up its population control activities by inducing the United Nations and various NGOs, including International Planned Parenthood, to do the dirty work. And the reason for all this is so that the United States can continue to get their natural resources of these lesser developed countries cheaply. And this is still the official United States policy for population control on a global scale. The voice crying out against the oppression of the poor. James 5, 1 and 4. Come now, you rich, weep and howl for the miseries that are coming upon you. Behold the wages of laborers who mold your fields, which you kept back by fraud, to cry out. The cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord of hosts. So it's the voice crying out against defrauding the workers of their just wages. And that's yet another global phenomenon. To take only one example, the prisons in China typically have a factory under a different name. People that could be sent to prison for such crimes as being a Catholic bishop or priest in union with Rome work for next to nothing in these prison factories producing those goods. The voice crying out against defrauding workers their just wages. There are certain mortal sins that are so evil they cry out to heaven for vengeance. For the purpose of this conference, that's how we'll understand the voice coming up from the altar. Let me continue. As we've seen, if the land had been defiled by sin, this in turn would defile the sanctuary. So a special ritual called the purification offering was necessary to cleanse and purify the sanctuary again. And the gravity of the sin and the status of the sinner together determine the magnitude of the defilement. In order to cleanse and purify the sanctuary if the whole nation sinned, then the sacrificial blood had to be smeared on the four horns of the golden altar of incense. This was the only way the altar could be purified. We've also seen that the ancient Jews took the four horns to symbolize the four corners of the earth, this huge altar dedicated to God. So given that virtually all the nations of the world are to varying degrees, guilty of the four sins that cry out to heaven for vengeance, and given that these sins have polluted both the land and the altar, and given that the altar needs purifying in this case, the altar that does need purifying in this case is the earth, 
Given that the only way the altar could be purified was by smearing blood on the four horns, given that the four horns symbolize the four corners of the earth, all parts of the earth, given all that, then sacrificial blood must be smeared over all parts of the earth. We'll pick up there in part two.